our members of Congress need to have the political will to make the necessary changes. And face it, from their standpoint, they're not rushing to fix it because they have only bad news for you. Hey, I'm gonna raise your taxes or cut your benefits or both, vote for me. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. Whether you're currently a senior citizen or just hope to live long enough to become one someday, funding our elder years is becoming a bigger and bigger challenge. For many, if not most Americans, Social Security will serve as the bedrock foundation for the income they can expect to receive later in life. But how does that program work exactly? What are the pitfalls and the best practices we should be aware of in deciding when and how to enroll in it? And for those currently not yet seniors, will there even be a Social Security program to rely on by the time we are? To provide answers to these and many more of the surprisingly tricky questions around Social Security, we're fortunate to speak with certified financial planner Mary Beth Franklin, author of the book Maximizing Your Social Security Retirement Benefits. Mary Beth, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Adam, thanks for inviting me. It's my favorite topic to talk about. And as a good friend of mine says, Social Security is like the gateway drug to financial planning in a good way, because when think people start thinking about retirement, their first question usually is, what should I do about Social Security? And once they delve into the many nuances of Social Security, it naturally leads to discussions about, well, what should I do with the rest of my money? So it's a great way to start a discussion about retirement. Great. I love that. The gateway drug to retirement planning. Um, so at a very high level here, we're going to talk about Social Security, um, but uh, just how well prepared are Americans today for retirement? I've, I've seen a number of stats that actually kind of frighten me a little bit about how unprepared it seems that a, a, a sizable majority of Americans are. But I'm curious, you follow this data all day long. What's the current situation there in terms of our general preparedness as a nation? Well, I think if we look overall, the general preparedness might be considered dismal. People simply aren't saving enough for retirement. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, we think back to the old days of when our parents or grandparents had a pension, a guaranteed source of income in retirement. Well, for most people, those pensions are history. And frankly, it's tough to save on your own to save enough because during your work life, you have these competing demands, a mortgage, kids, college, braces, you name it. Mm -hmm. And you have a set of pie of how much you can save. Now, certainly people who are lucky enough to have access to a retirement plan at work, a 401k or 403b, they're certainly ahead of the game because money that comes directly out of your paycheck that you never see and goes directly into your retirement account is a great way to save. And if you're fortunate, your employer is matching some of your contributions. But unfortunately, we have about half of the workers in the US who are working full time and don't have access to a retirement plan at work. And those are the people who are really falling behind. Sure, they can uh, contribute to an individual retirement account, but the contribution limits are much lower than a 401k. And frankly, it takes initiative on the worker's part to put that money aside. Yeah, um, all right, great. And, and I've seen stats too that of the workers who, who are covered by a retirement plan at work, like a 401k, uh, there's a good chunk of them that that don't avail themselves of it or don't max it out or whatnot. And the reason why I'm sort of digging into this is, is to show that for an awful lot of people, Social Security is going to be the foundation of their income stream in retirement. And for some folks, it might be the vast majority or in certain cases, maybe, maybe all of it. So I'm trying to set the stage for why Social Security is such an important thing to get right. And in terms of getting it right, um, we're, we're going to talk about the details of it. But um, there are strategies for when to take it. And, you know, there's some different flavors of Social Security, I believe. Um, what what's your gut tell you in terms of like, what's the percentage of, of current retirees who are on Social Security who have really optimized it? Well, it depends on how what you mean by optimized. Let's go over some basics. Um, people can claim Social Security retirement benefits as early as age 62. 
Um, but if they do, their benefits are reduced for the rest of their lives. It's a permanent decision. People can wait as late as age 70 to maximize those benefits. Uh, to give you an example, if my full retirement age is 66, which it is, and I started claiming Social Security at 66, I would get 100% of the benefits that I have worked so hard for and paid so much for in the form of FICA payroll taxes over my life. But if I was willing to delay up until age 70, I'm getting an extra 8% per year for every year I postpone claiming beyond my full retirement age up until age 70. So if my full retirement age is 66 and I wait till 70, I get 32% more. But as they say on TV, but wait, there's more. <laughs> the difference between claiming at the earliest age of 62 versus waiting until the maximum age of 70 would increase my monthly social security benefits by 76% for the rest of my life. As a certified financial planner, there is no investment that I can recommend that is guaranteed to increase 76% over an eight year waiting period. Now, it's not the right decision for everybody. You have to be healthy enough because you wanna live a long time to collect those bigger benefits and wealthy enough, what do you do for money in between? Right, you have to have the income in, in between. To yes. delay your benefits. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So I want to get into kind of more of the, the best practices of, 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 you know, what to do as an individual recipient of Social Security. Before we get there, a few more high level questions just about the program in general. So um, I want to I want to read this quote um, about uh, a recent report that was just put out by the Board of Trustees that manages Social Security. Um, at the beginning of this June, the Social Security Board of Trustees issued its annual report on the financial status of the social, of Social Security and Medicare trust funds and confirmed that without legislative reform, the combined assets of the old age and survivors insurance and disability insurance um, trust funds, uh, they're expected to be depleted in 2035. At that point, it's anticipated that 80% of benefits will be payable at, at that time per the report. So basically, things get into trouble if, if we don't see substantial legislative re reform in a little more than 10 years, I guess 12 years by this, um, and then they're going to start cutting payouts. So my question here is, how worried should both current and future retirees be about the Social Security Fund's dependability? Is this a real worry or do you feel confident that they're going to make those legislative reforms and protect all this? I would say yes and yes. It's a real worry. And I am confident that Congress will step up and fix this before the trust funds run dry sometime 2034, 35, because Social Security is the most popular and arguably the most successful federal program in history. And more importantly, Old people vote in higher percentages than any other part of the population. Congress knows this. The last time Social Security was in real danger of not being able to pay full benefits was 1983. And when did Congress fix it? 1983. Uh -huh. uh, and in its more than 87 year history, Social Security has never missed paying a benefit check. Yes, there are long-term financial challenges but these are fixable. It's less of a math problem and more of a political problem. Our members of Congress need to have the political will to make the necessary changes. And face it, from their standpoint, they're not rushing to fix it because they have only bad news for you. Hey, I'm gonna raise your taxes or cut your benefits or both, vote for me. Mm -hmm. I think as citizens, we should be contacting our members of Congress and saying, it's okay to talk about it. We won't fire you, but we know you need to talk about it. Let's give some examples of what changes might look like. Currently, the full retirement age is scheduled to go to 67 for people born in 1960 or later. That was one of the many changes made back in 1983 when the full retirement age was 65. And when Congress talked about raising the full retirement age by two years over a 40-year 
period. People screamed, they gnashed their teeth. They said this was awful. And then they forgot about it. And if you ask people, what's your full retirement age now? They say, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So over the eight decades that Social Security has been in force, our life expectancy has increased so much. That's the biggest challenge of retirement planning now is longevity, not just how much we save, but how many decades we will have to stretch our money over over our lifetime. So arguably, you could say, well, maybe we kick it up another year or two, maybe to age 70. But for today's two-year-olds, they'll get used to it. They're going to live to 120 anyway. The idea of making major public policy change is to do it gradually. The best thing they did in 1983 is phase in these changes over about 40 years, because that last piece, raising the full retirement age to 67, doesn't fully kick in until 2027, more than 40 years after they legislated the change. All right. All right. So um, just to quickly recap, sounds like you think they'll step in to address this probably in the last minute, <laughs> given basis uh, you know, what history has shown us, um, that they do have levers to play with. I'm curious, and I'm just asking you to to prognosticate here, um, you know, they can they can raise the, the qualifying age, uh, they can reduce payouts, uh, they could apply means testing which I think we've heard in the past, you know, if you're, if you have a certain net worth and you don't get it right. Um, they could potentially take money from somewhere else. I'm just making this up defense spending, say, we're going to shave X percent off of that and put that in here. Um, so they do have a lot of levers they can play with. Um, do you have a, a strong sense at this point, given how closely you follow this, which one of those levers they're, they're likely to pull, or do you think they might pull all of them? I think they will pull every available lever, because going back to my history as a congressional reporter for United Press International back in the 80s, the key to major legislation like this is everyone has to be equally unhappy to get it passed. Generally, the Republicans hate tax increases. Generally, the Democrats hate benefit cuts, and they will consider something like raising a full retirement age a benefit cut. So just like back in 1983, they'll have to do a little bit of both to make sure everybody has some protection and they will approve this on a bipartisan basis. It won't be easy, but I believe it will be done. If history is any guide, Congress seldom makes changes that would affect current or near retirees, people who would not have a lot of time to adjust to changes. Yeah. But you did mention means testing. In other words, higher income retirees, would they get little or no benefit? Again, if we go back to the beginning of Social Security in 1935, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he created this as an earned benefit that workers would pay into the system through their FICA payroll taxes, every paycheck. And when they retired, they would get a certain benefit out. If you say rich people who have paid into the system make too much money to get anything out, that breaks the basic tie of the social security system. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it goes against the basis of the system. The other thing is social security is a self-financing system. Those FICA taxes we pay are what pay out current social security benefits. So our FICA taxes do not go into a little private account for our future Social Security benefits. Our payroll taxes today are paying the benefits of today's retirees, our parents, our grandparents, whatever. So one of the things we talk about of this trust fund running dry, what does it mean? It does not mean Social Security is going bankrupt. There would be enough taxes from ongoing payroll taxes to pay about 80% of promised benefits, but nobody's gonna be satisfied with 80%. What is that trust fund anyway? Again, a history lesson. We go back to 1983. One of the very smart things that bipartisan commission did was say, hey, 1983, do you realize in about 30 years, the huge baby boomer generation of 76 million people are going to start retiring around 2010? Why don't we collect 
more FICA taxes than we re- need right now and put them in a reserve that we now know as a trust fund so that when FICA taxes alone are not sufficient to pay benefits, then we can stop t- tapping the trust fund. From 1983 to about 2010, that trust fund kept growing, growing, growing. It's around $3 trillion. 2010, we had boomers starting to retire and the Great Recession, where people lost their jobs and they and their employers were not paying FICA taxes. So for the first time, FICA taxes alone were not sufficient to pay Social Security benefits. We started tapping the interest earned on the trust fund. That was fine to last year, 2021. And suddenly, FICA taxes and interest on the trust funds alone were not sufficient to pay current benefits. So now we have stopped, started tapping the trust fund itself. If Congress does nothing between now and about 2035 or so, the trust funds would be exhausted and there would only be enough money from ongoing FICA taxes to pay about 80% of promised benefits. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And um, so we just talked about the the levers there. You said it's probably going to be a bipartisan compromise in the end where everybody's, you know, equally unhappy. Maybe taxes go up a little bit, maybe benefits get cut, whether by raging wages or means testing or whatever. But, um, and I presume it'll sort of be like um, kind of our debt ceiling showdowns where, you know, Congress basically goes into lockdown because uh, there's some imminent deadline coming up. Maybe the trust fund is, you know, it's 2034 and the trust fund's about to run dry. Uh, and they just say, okay, we can't kick the can anymore. We've got to get in a room and we can't leave until we've come up with something. I think a greatest example, I, again, as a former congressional reporter back in the days where legislation did get approved and, and there were bipartisan. There was bills. actual bipartisan yeah, collaboration. It, it, it worked differently and it's beyond the scope of this interview, but there's lots of reasons it doesn't work as well anymore. Um, but I, I believe they will come to this compromise again because it would be political suicide if they didn't. Yeah, okay. All right, well, look, okay. So uh, uh, there's some big structural challenges, but it, you know, you, you don't think people should take away oh my gosh, by the time I get to retirement age, there's going to be no social security for me. You think, no, there's going to be some program in place. And the biggest changes are going to be for generations that are just getting born right now. You know, most of those, mo- most of us who are, you know, at least halfway through our professional lives, we're, we're we're probably going to be okay, at least in terms of getting a check. Separate question on how much that check is actually going to be able to, to buy in terms of purchasing power, you know, given where things like inflation are going, but that will we'll set that aside for a moment. Keep, keep in mind, Social Security is one of the few sources of retirement income that is inflation adjusted. That, that does this have the COLA year, adjustment, yeah. Right. This year in 2022, uh, benefits went up 5.9%. That was the highest increase in 40 years. Next year, given our run of inflation in, in recent months, it's likely to be higher than that. So that's one of the reasons that people who can afford to wait to get the biggest benefit possible, if you have a larger base benefit to start each year when there's a cost of living adjustment, that percentage is being applied to a larger dollar base. So your raise is bigger each year. Right, right. Um, a great point. Great point. All right. I mean, we're, we're going to get some comments from people who say, yeah, but the government CPI measure under reports true inflation. And hey, that very well may be true, but at least it's giving these adjustments over time. Um, all right. So uh, for for those who are not yet currently collecting Social Security, can you just briefly explain how the program operates? A um, couple key questions. Um, what does it pay to whom? When does it kick in? You know, what options do you have around it? Uh, and then, then tax impacts. And if you can't remember each of those, I'll, I'll, I'll remind you as we go you'll, through. You'll here. prompt me as we go through it, right? Yeah. Well, Social Security is, as we said at the top of this interview, is for most Americans, the key base of their future retirement income. I like to think of it as a retirement income pyramid with Social Security at the base, On top of that, for many people, their retirement savings, their 401k, their IRAs. And in the past, 
that may have been enough to get most people through retirement. But as I mentioned, we're living a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps we have to look at other levers. As homeowners, many Americans have more money tied up in equity in their home than they have in their 401k. So down the line, they may have to think about, gee, how do I tap my home equity? Do I sell the big house and move into something smaller and cheaper and bank the difference? Do I take out a reverse mortgage? All sorts of things. A lot of people say they want to keep working in retirement, part-time, consulting, seasonally. That brings in money. And when you have money coming in, that's money you don't have to tap in your saving. And then at the top of that pyramid, everything else. Maybe you inherited some money from your parents. Maybe you got divorced and got a settlement. Maybe you have an income producing rental property. All those different layers, like a layer cake, are individual to each one of us. The challenge is taking the money out in the most tax efficient way that's going to last you the rest of your life, which may be about a 30 years. And that's why I encourage people who are nearing retirement to meet with a financial advisor, at least to get a fiscal check. You know, you think of it as your annual physical, this is your Mm -hmm. annual fiscal to see where you are on that path. And maybe you may need professional help going forward, or maybe a periodic checkup may work for you. But yes, the bottom of this is social security is key. How do we earn social security benefits? About 90% plus of U.S. workers are covered by the Social Security system. They pay FICA taxes, contributions into the system to earn benefits in the future. There are about a dozen states where public employees do not pay into the system and therefore are not qualified for benefits if they have a public pension based on work where they did not pay FICA taxes. Now, Social Security is a retirement system. For non-working spouses, they may be entitled to a spousal benefit worth half of the worker's benefit amount. If they have minor disabled or minor or disabled children, when a parent claims Social Security, the kids may get benefits. If your mate dies, you may be entitled to a survivor benefit. So it's an income program. It's a survivor program. It's like a life insurance, disability insurance policy all rolled into one. How do I get my benefits? It's based on my top 35 years of highest earnings. If I work 40 years, those five years where I was flipping burgers and delivering newspapers, those go away. It's going to be based on my top 35 years of earnings. But here's where the confusion comes in. Each year we pay FICA taxes up to a certain amount. This year in 2022, we pay FICA taxes on the first $147,000 of earnings. If I earn that or less, I'm paying FICA taxes on every dollar I earn and my employer is matching it. Now, here's the key. If I make more than that, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, I do not pay FICA taxes that support Social Security on that excess amount. I only pay it up to the taxable wage base. And my future benefits are based on the contributions I've made up to the taxable wage base. Here's one of the questions about reforming Social Security going forward. Back in 1983, the Bipartisan Commission said, as long as 90% of US wages are being taxed for Social Security purposes, Social Security will never run out of money. The problem is because of wage inequality, We have so many people making so much more than $147,000 who are not paying taxes on the excess amount to support Social Security that now only about 83% of U.S. wages are being taxed to fund Social Security. If we gradually let that float back up to about 90%, you're talking maybe $250,000 a year being covered, solves more than half of the long-term financing problem. If you put together raising raising taxes and gradually raising the full retirement age, you could solve the whole problem. And you would have two groups equally unhappy. Oh, really interesting. I'm I'm curious. Uh, So so, um, if you are due to receive Social Security, um, you will receive up to a maximum, uh, no matter how much you you earn. And, And I believe that's because of this this limit you're talking about, which is Correct. you know 
be, because there's a cap above which you're not paying social security uh, taxes, they're not going to give you any more, right? So presumably if they raised uh, the, the FICA limit um, up to say 250,000, to use your example there, would the people who were making more, would, would their social security increase more to reflect the, the greater tax that they're paying? It depends who you talk to. We, you would say based on the current formula, of course, if I pay more in, I'm going to get a bigger benefit in the future. You have people on the other side, when you talk about means testing, oh, those rich people don't need more. Right. We're going to make them pay more taxes in, but we're not going to raise their benefit. Again, that would be a real breach of the original philosophy of Social Security. Who's going to win on that? I don't know. The other component here you've got your top 35 years of your highest earnings up to a certain wage base, and you come up with what's called a, a primary insurance amount. And this formula is applied to how much you get. Social Security is designed that lower income workers get a higher replacement rate. Their Social Security benefit might be worth 40% of what they earned before they retired. It's a smaller dollar amount but it re represents a higher percentage of their pre-retirement earnings. Higher income people will get a bigger dollar benefit, but it on might only represent maybe 25% of their pre-retirement earnings. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who are most likely to have 401ks, IRAs, other investments to supplement their social security. The other component, and this is the key that all Americans have to understand is the age when you first claim benefits will determine how much you get for the rest of your life. Yes, you can claim benefits as early as 62, which may be appropriate in some cases, but your benefits are now going to be reduced 25 to 30%, depending on what your full retirement age for the rest of your life. All right, so let's, let's talk about that, which is, um... It sounds like the the first age where you can claim Social Security is is sixty two. Um, so when somebody qualifies for what what happens? Does the government send you a notice that says, "Hey, you've qualified. Do you want to take it? Do you want to wait?" What what is the actual nuts and bolts of the process like? Well, in the old days, we all used to get this estimated benefit statement in the mail. It was usually a four page statement, told us what our benefits would be at sixty two for retirement age and seventy, and explain some other details, and most importantly, would have our career earnings year by year, not just how much we earn, but how much we had paid in Social Security and Medicare taxes. I find that one of the most valuable documents in financial planning. Well, it was expensive to mail those statements out each year to everybody. So now that same information is available 24 seven online but you need to set up your personal social security account to do this. Everyone 18 years or older should go to ssa.gov, which is the social security's official website, ssa.gov and set up your personal my account. It's secure. It will ask you weird questions like, which bank did you get your mortgage from? Or how many years have been in your house? They're all um, identity theft protection questions to make sure that you are who you say you are. And once you set up this account, then anytime you can go on to check your, your latest earnings records, how much you've paid in taxes, and what your estimated benefits will be. So that's the first key is you should be aware, check it once a year, see where your estimated benefits are. And even though it's your employer's responsibility to report your earnings and, and send those taxes to the government, you want to make sure it's right. So if you know you made $80,000 last year, but your line says zero, well, there's a mistake. And you want to contact Social Security and tell them about it because an accurate earnings record, it is what's going to determine your future benefit. If you see a mistake, you want to make sure it's fixed. Okay, great point. And we'll, we'll put up the, uh, the link to the ssa.gov website when we, when we do the editing here. Um, okay, so that, that is telling us as we approach retirement age what we should expect uh, from Social Security um, when we start taking it. So let's say you turn 62. A, does the government send you anything to say, you know, ask if you want to take it, or is it totally proactive? Like if you just do nothing, it will wait until you're 70 and then it'll then automatically enroll you. 
you can claim benefits as early as 62, but that's totally up to you. The government's not going to come and tell you, hey, claim your benefits. That's up to you. And frankly, if you can afford to wait, the better off you're going to be. Um, often when you enroll in Medicare at 65, you'll get some communication from the government about your social security benefits. If you have not claimed your benefits by 70, you'll usually get some sort of message, particularly if you have this socialsecurity.gov my account, hey, you haven't claimed your benefits because it makes no sense to delay claiming your benefits beyond 70 because these very valuable delayed retirement credits of 8% per year stop at age 70. So even if you're still working, even if you don't need the money by age 70, you definitely want to claim. The big challenge, speaking of work, is for people who want to claim early and they continue to work. So many people do not realize that if you claim Social Security benefits before your full retirement age, which can be anywhere between 66 and 67, and you continue to work, you may temporarily lose some or all of your benefits if you make too much money. And this year, too much money in 2022 is about $20,000 a year. If you earn Ooh. more than that, you That's are not very much. No, it's not, which is why you don't want to claim Social Security benefits early if you keep working. If the, the actual limit in 2022 is $19,560. If you make more than that, Social Security is going to withhold some or all of your benefits. Once you reach your full retirement age, those earnings restrictions go away. And any benefits that you have lost due to excess earnings, because you were younger and working, will be restored in the form of larger monthly benefits once you reach full retirement age. So my number one rule is, if you plan to keep working, don't claim Social Security early. It makes no sense. It can be an accounting nightmare. Wait till okay. you're full retirement age or later. And, and, and sorry, let me just make sure I understood that. So uh, if you declare early and you work and you make above the, the threshold, they withhold benefits. It sounds like you said you, you, you do get them back at some future date in, in higher payments. So they're not, they're not gone for good, Correct. but they're delayed and the time value money works against you. Right. So here's the example. Um, let's say my um, full retirement age is 66 and I'm entitled to $2,000 a month, but I'm going to claim it 62 because my retirement age, I'm going to take a 25% haircut to start with. I'm not going to get $2,000 a month. I'm going to get $1,500. And they're going to say, hey, Mary Beth, do you plan to keep working? Well, I might try and pull a fast one and say, no, I don't plan to work. Mm -hmm. A year or two years later, when Social Security matches up my tax records with the IRS, they'll say, look at that. We overpaid you $33,000. We'd like that back right now in a lump sum. Do you really want to get into that situation? Oh, wow. Yeah. If I'm claiming early and I answer honestly, they're going to say, do you plan to keep working? Yes, I do. How much do you expect to earn next year? Mm -hmm. $40,000. Well, that's roughly $20,000 over the limit. And if you were going to get $2,000 a month, that means we're going to hold back the first 10 months of benefits before we pay you anything. And then that calendar clock is going to start over every single January 1st until I reach my full retirement age. Really, if you plan to keep working, don't claim benefits early. It's not worth it. If you're not working, and you need the money, go ahead and take it. That's what it's there for. But be aware, because you're claiming early, your benefits are going to be reduced by 25% or more for the rest of your life. It does not magically pop up to the full amount at your full retirement age. You are making the decision. I want to claim early, so I'm going to get smaller checks for a longer period of time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there may be some instances where it might make sense to, to, to declare early. It seems to me like they're probably special cases. We'll get to that in a bit, um, but a couple other sort of high-level questions here. So Social Security income is taxed, correct? Correct. Up to 85% of your Social Security benefits, the amount of your benefits, 
are taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. There's something called combined income. It's everything on your tax return, your adjusted gross income, which includes half your social security benefits, plus the other half of your social security benefits, plus if you have any tax exempt interest from investing in muni bonds, they add all that together and that's considered your combined income. That's what determines how much of your benefits will be taxed. If you're single and your combined income is over $25,000, or if you're married and your combined income is over $32,000, some of your income is going to be taxed. Worst case scenario, up to 85% of your social security benefits can be taxed. So those very low thresholds that were set in 1983 and have never been adjusted for inflation. (laughs) Every year that there's a cost of living adjustment, so your benefits are going up, it means more and more people are paying taxes on their benefits. I would predict one of the changes in the future might be, let's raise the thresholds, but then maybe wealthier retirees would pay taxes on 100% of their benefits. I have seen suggestions of a $50,000 threshold for singles and $100,000 threshold for couples. But again, this is all conjecture. Right, right. Okay. Um, and so I presume you also need to keep an eye if you're near, if, if your income, your other income is bringing you near the top of your tax bracket, Social Security could kick you into a higher tax bracket, potentially, right. correct? And, and not to muddle the question, but the real dirty secret of retirement that surprises retirees more than anything else is your income in retirement not only dictates how much you pay in income taxes, it's going to tell you how much you pay in Medicare premiums because Medicare is means tested and you might be paying $170 a month per person and I might be paying $500 a month per person for the exact same service based on my income in retirement. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, and you're already uh, taking notes earlier. We got to do one of these on, on Medicare as well. Um, in fact, uh, we just did a retirement seminar over the, the past weekend and I was, my brain was a little sore, you know, hearing a lot of the different Medicare elements there. It's a very complicated thicket to navigate. Um, but we'll leave that for a different day. Um, all right. So, uh, we have to be careful of the tax impacts as well. Um, so you you mentioned earlier that that you've got to be proactive once you turn 62 about choosing when you want to start taking Social Security. When you get to 70, I, I'm assuming few people fall into this category, but if you get to 70 and you're just not paying attention and a few years go by, are you just missing out? Like they don't auto enroll you? They don't auto enroll you. You have to claim benefits. And there are people who have missed out. What's interesting is When we talk about retirement accounts, we hit a certain required minimum distribution age where we must start taking money out of retirement accounts. It used to be 70 and a half, and the maximum age for accruing Social Security benefits is 70. Well, now that the required minimum distribution age has been pushed back to 72, a lot of people think that the Social Security maximum age has been pushed back too. It has not. It is still 70. All right, so you got to you got to be paying attention here. Um, real quick comments about uh, you mentioned earlier that um, so spouses, even if a spouse didn't work in the workforce, it was a stay at home spouse, that they can get spousal um, social security. And in, in fact, um, I, I've heard of people too that uh, were divorced, um, but but one was able to basically apply for social security of their ex spouse uh, from from their working wages. Um, and you also talked about um, survivor uh, Social Security. So can you just briefly talk in both those cases about what process those people need to go through to get those benefits? Let's start with the single person. Let's say you were never married and you're single. When you claim Social Security, it's pretty simple. Your average lifetime earnings, you know, based on those top 35 years of earnings and your age at time of claim. The sooner you claim, the smaller the benefit. The later you claim, the bigger the benefits. That's very straightforward. Married couples have some claiming options. I urge married couples to think of their Social Security claiming decision 
as a household decision, not two separate people. What do we do to maximize our lifetime benefits even after one of us dies? So let's start with the simple case. Let's say we have the husband who's working, benefited $2,000 a month, wife's never worked, but because she's married to a worker who's entitled to a social security benefit, once he claims his benefit and she is at least age 62 and eligible for social security, she can claim a spousal benefit. If she waits till her full retirement age, her spousal benefit is worth half of his full retirement age benefit. Even if he claims early and it's reduced, her spousal benefit is still worth half of his full retirement age benefit. If he waits, if she waits waits till her full retirement age, she can claim earlier, but it's permanently reduced. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at a more typical situation where the husband and wife both have their own retirement benefit. Um, Generally, when you file for your benefits and you're entitled to two benefits, your own record and as a spouse, you're going to be paid the higher of the two benefits. Let's say my benefit as a spouse is $800 a month. And my benefit on my husband's record is $1,000 a month. I'm going to get that $1,000 if I wait till my full retirement age to collect. If I collect early, it's going to be reduced. Now, when it comes to divorce people, it's my favorite part Hmm. of Social Security. Now, Social Security has about 2,700 rules. And a lot of the rules are exceptions. And a lot of the exceptions apply to divorced spouses. So the first important rule of divorce is you must be married at least 10 years, divorced and currently single to be able to collect benefits on your ex. So there must be at least a decade between I do and I don't. You're one day short and you're going to get squat. Now, in most cases, if you have your own benefit and it's larger than your benefit as a spouse, that's the one you're going to get. But here's the important part for married couples and eligible divorced spouses. A spousal benefit while your mate or ex is alive is worth up to 50% of his or her full retirement age benefit. When they die, your survivor benefit is worth 100% of what they were collecting. So spousal 50% while they're alive, survivor 100% when they're dead. So yes, your ex is worth twice as much dead than alive. (laughs) That's my next question. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Okay. So very interesting. So, um, so I guess in both cases, um, let's take the, the, the happily married couple, um, the, uh, the, the spouse that was, had a higher benefit who worked more, um, uh, once they've claimed, um, their spouse can claim a spousal benefit up to half of, of the working spouse's full benefit. If that working spouse then passes away, um, the spouse benefit, the spousal benefit can then double, correct? It basically becomes a survivor benefit and her smaller retirement spousal benefit goes away. But again, think of this from a household standpoint. Let's say he was getting $2,000 a month. She was getting $1,000 a month. That's $3,000 as a household. He dies. Good news. She steps up to the $2,000 a month, but then she loses her $1,000. So from that household, it has now dropped from $3,000 to $2,000. Right, right. So that's why it's a piece of an overall retirement plan. What other provisions are there for the surviving spouse? Is there an annuity? Is there life insurance? Is there a pension with survivor benefits? You always have to look at how do you provide for the surviving spouse? And given that as the main um, goal of most married couples in claiming social security, your first question should be, how do I maximize a potential survivor benefit? And you do that by having the spouse with the bigger benefit, let's say it's a husband, but it's gender neutral, waiting until age 70 to create the largest possible retirement benefit while they're both alive, And if he dies first, which is actuarially likely, the wife will step up to his great big survivor benefit and her smaller benefit goes away. So that's the goal. But what do we do right now? Let's say she has her own 
retirement benefit. It's not a whole lot, and she's not working right now. She may want to go ahead and claim benefits early at 62. And even though her retirement benefits are permanently reduced, it brings some money into that household and takes away a bit of the sting of having the husband wait till 70. And here's the other important part of Social Security, retirement benefits, survivor benefits, two different pots of money. Right. Even though she claims her reduced retirement benefits early and her retirement benefits are reduced for the rest of her life, it has no impact on her survivor benefit if she is at least full retirement age when she's widowed. Right. So her smaller stream, because she took it early, as long as she's over 62 when her spouse dies, that jumps up to his full uh, benefit as if her survivor she is, benefit. If she's over full retirement age, which is... Oh, sorry. Full, full retirement yeah. age, which is... Yeah. Remind me what that is right now. 66 to 67, depending on your birth year. Okay. Thanks. If you're born in 1960 or later, it's 67. Okay, and then let's let's now jump to the 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 uh, divorced ex. Um, so uh, you you can you you'll, you may have your spousal benefit claim from being married to this person a long time ago. Um, it's decades later that spou- that ex spouse dies. You can then jump up to their full survivor benefit, right? Yes. And here's the crazy part. Let's say the ex remarried. His current widow gets benefits too. Let me give you an example. That's my next question. So you can actually have multiple survivors of that same spouse, right? Yeah. Think of it as the Johnny Carson rule. You know, four wives all named Joanne. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, let's say we have John and Mary. They're married at least 10 years. They get divorced. Mary remains single. John then marries his secretary, Susie. You know that story. They're married for at least 10 years, get divorced, Susie remains single. John doesn't like to be alone. He goes to the local pub and meets Tiffany. Tiffany's 30. They fall madly in love and get married. And now they have a little two-year-old, Johnny. And John drops dead. Who gets benefits? Everybody gets Everybody. Benefits. The first ex-wife, married at least 10 years, divorced, gets 100%. The second F. A uh, second ex-wife married at least 10 years, divorced, gets 100%. Two-year-old Johnny gets 75% every month until he turns 18. And his mom, Tiffany, who's caring for a child under age 16, gets 75% every month till little Johnny turns 16. So when you worry about the long-term financing of Social Security, less about the trust funds, more about Wow. Amazing. And I wonder, too, like, is this part of the reason why the fund is you know, getting depleted here because you have this multiplicative effect. <laughs> and, and here's another crazy exception. Remember I told you to be get benefits as an eligible divorced spouse, you must be married at least 10 years, divorced and currently single. Maybe mm-hmm. you married somebody in between and that marriage ends, you're currently single. You have to be single to collect on a living ex if you're eligible. But if you wait till 60 or later to remarry, and you can't collect on a living ex, but you can collect on a dead ex, even if you're married to somebody else. And again, when you're entitled to more than one benefit, a survivor benefit on your ex, your own retirement benefit, a benefit on your current spouse, you only get to pick one, but it's the highest of the benefits. It's the highest of the bunch. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So again, a lot of what we're doing here. So on on, on this channel, uh, Mary Beth, I, I beat the drum a lot of why people need to work with a, a good financial uh, professional, a good financial advisor to help them navigate through all this, because you're giving a great example here of, you know, at, at the high level, understanding Social Security is pretty simple. But as you get into the specifics, all of a sudden, there are all these different questions that, you know, having guidance to to answer will be useful. And then as you're trying to put it together in a much larger patchwork quilt of how does this income supplement other income I'm trying to build for retirement? Um, you know, it, it all just sort of underscores the need to have a quarterback here to help you navigate through all this. I see you nodding exactly. as I'm saying all this. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, gosh, um, with the spousal benefits real quick, I assume that's sort of like 
claiming social security by the time you're 70 like social security is not going to reach out to you and say hey we see we saw that your spouse died or that your ex from 40 years ago died do you want to do you want to take the claim you have to be staying on top of this and reaching out correct well again it depends let's say i am a spouse and my um some or all of my social security benefit is as a spouse it's on my husband's record so i've been collecting as a spouse he dies I am automatically going to stick up to this larger survivor benefit and my smaller spousal benefit goes away. Okay. So you don't have to do anything in that case. You don't have to do anything, but you have no control over it. Your a survivor benefit is worth its maximum amount if I collect it at my full retirement age. If I am collecting as a spouse, say at 62, and my husband dies when I'm 64, I am automatically going to step up to a larger survivor benefit, but now it's not going to be worth 100% of his benefit because I'm collecting it before my full retirement age. I've sort of lost control of that situation. If, however, I'm a woman who has my own retirement benefit and I'm collecting my own retirement benefit and my husband dies, I can choose when to claim that survivor benefit. Oh, so interesting. It's, it's a so really good reason to, again, to not claim early if you can, even if you're a spouse, because just in case your spouse dies before you're at full retirement age, you can get locked into a lower survivor benefit. Exactly. And here's the biggest mistake I see that people, including financial advisors, make. They'll say, well, I have a widowed client and I told her to wait till 70 to collect her survivor benefits. And I say, no, 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 a survivor benefit is worth the maximum amount at her full retirement age. Survivor benefits do not grow by 8% a year up until right. age 70. Those are only retirement benefits. So I'll give you two examples. Say you have um, uh, a woman who has her own retirement benefit, but it's small compared to what her survivor benefit is going to be. And let's say she's not working. She probably wants to collect her own reduced retirement benefit as early as age 62. And then when she gets to her full retirement age, switch to her full survivor benefits. She doesn't want to wait beyond that because they don't keep growing. Flip the story around. We've got a business executive. His wife dies of breast cancer. Um, he's still working. At his full retirement age, he could collect a survivor benefit on his late wife, um, he'd get the full benefit because he's full retirement age. The earnings restrictions go away at full retirement age. But in the meantime, his own retirement benefit continues to grow by 8% a year up until age 70. And then he would switch to his maximum benefit at 70. Just another example of why you want to consult a qualified financial professional to help you with these decisions, because in many cases, they're irreversible and you could be losing a lot of money. All right. So you can basically be sort of switching teams on the way to your eventual long time. Um, if, if it's a retirement and a survivor benefit, two different yeah. pots of money. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, look, um, super fascinating, um, very useful insights. Um, two main questions for you. Um, one is, uh, are there are there any best practices you recommend around claiming your social security that we haven't already talked about yet? Well, I think Americans need to realize that the decision when to retire and when to claim social security benefits are two separate decisions. Mm -hmm. They don't have to occur at the same time. For people who plan to keep working, that solves the income problem. And maybe you can defer claiming your social security until it's worth more later up until age 70. But even people who decide to retire early may be able to use other sources of income, like drawing down a retirement account, a 401k, an IRA, as sort of a bridge to creating a larger Social Security benefit in the future. And one of the other benefits of that strategy of tapping your retirement accounts first is that once we get to required minimum distribution age, which is now 72, if I have been tapping those accounts all along, my required amount that I take out each year is likely to be smaller. Mm -hmm. 
once I start tapping that RMD, I'm pretty much locked into what my income's going to look like going forward, which is going to affect my income taxes and how much I pay for Medicare premiums. People who have this runway between like 62 and 72 may be able to make smart financial decisions that will reduce their income taxes and Medicare in the future. For example, some people may want to take some of those traditional retirement accounts they have and convert a little at a time to a Roth IRA. Yes, they will pay income taxes on the amount they convert, but now they're creating a pool of tax-free money in the future. So when you look at your tax brackets and you look at your Medicare brackets and say, wow, I was $5,000 over that tipped me into this higher Medicare bracket. If I had taken $5,000 out, out of my tax-free Roth IRA instead, I wouldn't be paying that extra Medicare premium. Literally, you could go over these thresholds by a dollar and it's going to cost you an extra 600 bucks a year in Medicare premiums. All right. All right. Again, underscoring the need to have a good advisor slash advisory team helping you figure out, okay, this is the right way to, to, to play it this year, given all the other factors going on in your life. I um, have one other tip I'd like yeah, to please. offer. Even though we think of Social Security as an irrevocable decision, there really are two do-over options. One is within 12 months of first claiming benefits, you can change your mind and withdraw your application for benefits. But there's a catch. You have to pay back any benefits you have received. Okay. And if anybody was collecting in your record, like a spouse or a child, you have to pay those benefits back too. But it wipes the slate clean as if you have never claimed Social Security. So at a future date, when you're older and entitled to a bigger benefit, that's what you're going to get. All right. So I want to wave a big flag here for, for listeners because there might be people listening here who within the past 12 months took it early, are listening to you and saying, oh, dear God, why did I do that? I wish I could undo it. You're giving them a way to do that right now. Correct. It's called five, Form 521, and you can call Social Security and even do this over the phone. I want to withdraw my application for benefits. And then they'll say, and this is how much you owe us. Mm -hmm. And once you pay them back, then you wipe the slate clean. Now there's a second opportunity. Maybe you've missed that 12-month window. Or you don't like the idea of paying a lot of money back, which is understandable. Um, now, if you wait till your full retirement age or later, there's another strategy. You can suspend your benefits. It means the checks that you have been receiving stop. And if anybody's receiving checks on your record, they stop too, except a divorced spouse. They can keep getting their money. Why would I do that? My checks stop, but now they start growing by 8% a year. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Husband's full retirement age is 66. He decided to claim early at 62. He was fine with getting a smaller check. What the heck? But never occurred to him that if he got a smaller benefit and he died first, now his widow is going to get a smaller benefit. So remember, survivor benefit is worth 100% of what the late worker was collecting or entitled to collect when they died. He gets a smaller benefit. She's going to get a smaller benefit. He could wait till his full retirement age and suspend his benefits. The checks will stop. But now they're growing by 8% a year up until age 70. So if he was supposed to collect at 66, he collected early. He took a 25% haircut. He collects for four years. He suspends his benefits. They're now growing by 8% a year, 32% increase. If I compare that 75% of benefit he got at 62 and I multiply it by 1.32, he now comes out with 99% of his full retirement age benefit. He has effectively restored his full retirement age benefit by age 70. And if he dies first, that's what his widow is going to get. That's the best reason to suspend a benefit. Hmm. All right. No, oh, it's fascinating. So there's just so many layers to this onion. Um, all right. Well, um, sort of a similar question on the other side of the coin. Um, I'm sure we've already talked about a few taking it too early when you don't need to whatnot, but what are some of the most common or biggest mistakes that you see folks making right now about social security? Um, just not being aware of all the rules. The first one is your, your initial claiming age is so important. 
Another thing is we talked about lifetime benefits. Now, if you worked your whole life, you probably have a decent benefit, $3,000 a month or more. But what about those people who stayed home to raise their kids or take care of elderly family members? They may not have enough credits to be eligible for Social Security on your own. You effectively have to work at least 10 years in covered employment to earn four credits a year for the minimum number of 40 credits to be eligible for Social Security. But if you only work 10 years, you could have a really small benefit. Right. Well, good because they're still dividing by 35, your top 35 years of earnings. So you have 10 years of earnings and 25 years of zeros. But every year you continue to work, regardless of your age, regardless of whether you're actually collecting Social Security, every year you have earnings adds to your earnings records. So it could increase your future Social Security benefits. That's very important, particularly for women who have had sporadic careers. They have the ability to keep working, even if it's part time, and possibly increase their future benefits. Okay. And obviously making income along the way as well. Um, so I think I did say earlier, we'd come back to this specific question. So um, it, it sounds like as a rule of thumb, uh, you want to wait as long as possible to take your social security benefits and ideally be working up until then too, because you're, you're adding to your 35 years of, of work history that they look at. Um, when might it not make sense to do that? When might it make sense to, to take it early? I think if you're in poor health and not likely to live to average life expectancy, you may need the money now. We found a lot of people as a result of COVID, they either lost, lost their job during the recession that followed it, or due to health concerns, retired early because they were afraid to go back to work. Those people very much may want to claim benefits early. And maybe the situation is turned around. They claim for a year and now they got a job again. Uh, they could look down the line of maybe suspending their benefits at full retirement age to grow that future benefits. So if you need the money, if you're in poor health, those are both very good reasons to claim benefits early. And if you're the lower earning spouse of a married couple and you're not working, therefore not subject to earnings restrictions, you may want to claim early. People who should not claim early, the ones who say, you know, I think Social Security is going broke. I'm going to grab it now while I can. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a bit like saying the stock market just dropped 30%. I want to go completely to cash. The only thing you have guaranteed is you have now locked in a loss. Yes, you could claim benefits at 62. Your benefits are going to be reduced by 25 to 30%, depending on your full retirement age. And let's imagine worst case scenario, Congress doesn't fix the trust fund situation. And they say, guess what? We're going to cut your benefits by 20%. That's on top of the 25% cut you already took. How smart does that sound? So I would say claiming benefits early out of fear is not a good idea. One other thing I've heard a lot of people this year say, wow, there was a 5.9% cost of living adjustment. I guess I should claim now to cash in on that. Don't have to do that. Any year that you are eligible for Social Security, meaning starting at age 62, up until the time you claim benefits, you automatically receive every cost of living adjustment that is awarded from the time you turn 62 until the time you claim. So you do not have to claim now to cash in on this year's 5.9 cost of living adjustment. Now, if you're 61, you don't get it. You have to be at least 62. But I think next year's cost of living adjustment for 2023 will be even bigger. So if you're 62 next year, that will be baked into your future benefit. All right. Well, look, you're such a wonderful font of wisdom on this very important topic for retirees. Um, for folks that have really enjoyed getting to know you through this conversation, Mary Beth, and would like to follow you and your work going forward, where should they go? Well, just Google my name. That's the easiest. You'll find that I write a weekly column for investment news. It's primarily for financial advisors, but is written in a way that's very easy for consumers to understand. I also have an ebook. You can go to maximizing social security benefits.com. Everything we discussed here today is in one place in an ebook that you can download. And guess what? I don't think anybody should have to read 300 pages about social security. It's 50 pages. 
You can get the basics and then go right to married, divorced, single, public employees, family with kids to get all the basics that we just discussed here today. And you can follow me on Twitter at MBF Retire Pro. Great. Excellent. Well, thanks so much. Uh, we will put up links to all of those, your Twitter account, uh, your name to Google, your ebook uh, on the screen here when we edit this. I'll also put a link to your ebook in the description below this video. Um, well, look, uh, Mary Beth, thanks so much. Folks watching, a couple quick related resources. Um, one is, I mentioned earlier that we just did a, a full like two-hour retirement planning webinar um, that did address Social Security, just not in nearly as much depth as, as Mary Beth just did here. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a key component, but it's one of many key components to your retirement um, planning and your retirement prospects. So if you want to go watch that webinar for free, just go to Wealthion.com slash retirement planning. Uh, also, we've talked a lot about the importance of working with a financial professional. Um, if you don't already have a good one to work with on this, um, definitely consider talking to one, one of the ones that Wealthion endorses. You can set up one of those free consultations with them. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with them. They will just sit down, talk with you about your personal situation, give you their advice. You can determine how best that you want to carry things forward from there. To do that, just go to Wealthion.com and uh, fill out the short form there. Um, last, I just want to remind folks uh, that we are uh, upcoming Wealthy on Fall Conference is coming up uh, next month. And uh, we are coming up, and we're just in the last couple of days before the early bird discount price for that expires. And that's almost 30%. So want to make sure the folks that are interested register before that early bird price goes away. So if you are, uh, definitely go to wealthion.com slash conference. Uh, right after this video and make sure that you you register for that. Um, and if you've really enjoyed this conversation with Mary Beth, you like having domain experts like her come on and talk about key elements, uh, key important elements of our wealth building process like retirement planning, do me a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Mary Beth, thank you so much again for your time. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Adam. Bye. Thank you.